morning. Thank you for joining us for the Hayward College of Business Entrepreneurship Forum. I'm Samantha Hooker, a marketing specialist at the college, and I'll be serving as the host this morning. Before we get started, I'll go over the format and overview for today. Satish Tishpande, Dean of the Hayworth College of Business, will introduce our speaker, Gordon Van Ghent. He will give a presentation on his experience as an entrepreneur, which will be followed by a Q&A session. Please use the Q&A or chat feature to enter questions during the presentation. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Satish Deshpande. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, welcome, I'm Satish Deshpande, Dean of the Hayworth College of Business, and thank you for joining us today. Our sponsor for this event is Blue Ox Credit Union. I thank them for their support to the college and uh, their dedication to help businesses in the local community. Uh, we have a great speaker for you today. Uh, Gordon Van Ghent is a formally trained creative professional in the field of music and audio technology. After working independently for years as a musician, composer, arranger, and audio engineer, he started a small business in music and audio production in 2010. Today, Overneat Creative is a successful multimedia service in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Welcome, Gordon, and welcome to uh, Hayworth College. Thank you so much for having me, Satish, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm very honored, Samantha and Kim, for, for having me here today. So, uh, yeah, like Satish said, I am, uh, I've, I've been a, a creative professional for many years, and uh, I'm going to go through my background and in, in where I came from and then how I started my businesses and uh, sort of where it, it took us and what I've learned a bit along the way and, and where, where I am now. Um, I made a little, little PowerPoint because I can do that. And uh, please, please forgive that I just use the, uh, I use whatever default, whatever design settings were created for me from, from the Microsoft people. So there's nothing, nothing fancy about it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I started back in, the, I, I, I'm from Virginia Beach, Virginia originally. Um, I found some very beautiful pictures of me as a young man that I can share with you all. Um, and I moved to West Michigan in 2003 for college at Western. I sort of wanted to reboot my life um, from Virginia and decided to start kind of a new direction, new journey in, in Michigan. My, my mom's from Michigan, so I moved up here um, having, she had gone to Western. So I was like, okay, I'll check it out. And I really liked the school of music. And, um, started in 2003 and then I graduated in 08 with uh, a BA in music, um, jazz guitar was my instrument. Um, and then I, I also had another major in comparative religion because I was working in ministries and churches in the Kalamazoo area as well. And then I stuck around, they offered me an assistantship and I, I stuck around at Western and got my master's in music composition in 2010. Um, and I think, I think this picture down at the bottom here, I don't know if you see my mouse, but that is, that is like freshman 03 Gordon, you know, at an open mic night at a, the dorm somewhere. So that's, that's little Gordon right there. You can make fun of me all you want to. Um, so I started, um, the actual business elements of my life were started in the middle of my college career. One of the things you do as a musician is you teach lessons. That's sort of a, a, a generic job that we all do because we all got lessons and it's a way for us to continue music in, the, in society and to make a living for ourselves. So around 2005, uh, I started teaching my, my first private lessons, which means I was getting income that was not, you know, W, W, uh, two or W Ford. So it was all, you know, self-employment income. Um, and then around that time, I also started working as a musician freelance. And it's what they're training us to do in the school of music. So I started playing for musicals and jazz quartets and just variety of, of gigs across the state, eventually parts of the country, um, depending on what I was, you know, what I was able to do. Um, and then around 2007, I got, I got heavily into production. I've always really been into production of music. Um, I, I don't know. I felt more, I was I was always super nervous on stage. I never felt comfortable. Um, I, I enjoyed it when I went well, but I I tended to fall in love with the perfectionism of the production, like making sure everything was set up right and it sounded right. And um, so I started taking the classes at Western. This was before they had a degree in in audio or music audio or multimedia arts technology. So I was just taking the classes in the studio and. Um, eventually became the, um, like one of the primary engineers for the studio and was taking clients in there. And I started learning more about, um, just the whole process of production and, and the, the behind the scenes business of making music. 
Um, and then as part of my entrepreneur journey, I, I was doing music and one of my freelance roles was as a worship leader, a musician for churches. And I was asked to help start a church in 2009, um, which I did. And that was a big learning experience because starting a, starting a not-for-profit, um, coming from a self-employed background and starting a not-for-profit was a very different experience. There's a very different set of needs, different set of uh, how, you, how you make money as a not-for-profit or how you get funding as a not-for-profit. Um, so that was a big part of my early journey as well. So those were my first forays in self-employment and business. In, uh, in 2010, I was graduating with my master's and I was thinking to myself, what the heck am I going to do with my life? Um, do I want to keep focusing on composition? Do I want to focus on um, church stuff? Do I want to focus on studio? I wasn't really sure. So um, one of the things I realized after after doing my own wedding at that point was I really liked the like the event planning and production of of setting up all the players and, and making sure everyone was paid and rehearsed and, and prepared and um, writing the music for my wedding and arranging it for the parts. And um, I really enjoyed that. So I, I, I sort of what I decided to do, I always joke that I couldn't find a job that I wanted to do. So I made one up. Um, and so I started my first LLC, which was just GVG Productions as my initials, my it's my Dutch initials, so I'm, my family's from the Netherlands, and you know, in America, we use like the middle GMV would be my initials. But my father, uh, Paul, his, you know, and, and all of the other Van Gents from the Netherlands were VGs, so it was PVG, and I was GVG. So GVG had a kind of fun ring too. People were calling me that, so I started GVG Productions, and uh, you know, I got a friend of mine who was in graphic design, and I, I really focused a lot on like, what's it like to start a business? I didn't even really know what I was doing. I was. Uh, I was just trying it. A friend helped me with some design work and I was I was focusing early on on weddings. I mean, weddings was, you know, a big market around and I had just had mine, so I was very familiar with it. Um, but I was also focused in on a lot of the things that I had been doing already um, for uh, audio engineering for, for people, for artists, um, being a freelance musician and booking musicians for things. Um, but I also had a couple of friends who started a business at the same time in video. So we, so we were talking about starting it together, but because I didn't really know what I was, what I wanted to do yet, I, I started a separate LLC and um, I was reading some books and I think someone, some, someone got me like some, and this is before the days of heavily interneted. It was still internet, but it was, I was still getting books like business for dummies and things like that. Not so much the reading articles. Um, so I was reading about what an LLC was and how to, you know, what an EIN was and you know, things that were important at the time, you know, your website was the most important thing to have at the time, so making sure I had a solid uh, GUI. And I was just using, I was just using, you know, um, came with, came with Mac, uh, the um, iWeb at the time, I think it was called iWeb. It was a very simple interface and I just kind of read about it and, and, and went to GoDaddy out of domain and, you know, went to the state of Michigan site. At, at the time I could still do, that was, that was probably the earliest days. I don't know when they started doing things online, but I was doing a lot of it online and getting it, getting it started. And so I said, I said, we did uh, video, audio, photo, and music were the, um, the four things we did. Uh, the, the video and photo was, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Actually, that was <laughs> giving away. That's actually my later business. It was live original and recorded music was my original, original plan. So it was booking and playing for live events. Um, creating original music for things like film, like I made a I made a score for a, an indie video game. Um, that was one of my first clients. Uh, and then recorded music would be you know recording albums for for clients and um, producing their music. Um, and much of my early business, I one of my one of my fondest memories was you know I, I'm I'm putting I'm writing letters like sending it to different places where I think that people might hire me for and one of the one of the places that contacted me was a school system in Kalamazoo who needed um audio for a musical and I they, they needed some equipment and I had I mean I had I invested some money in some equipment but not enough not in any one area and all the different areas like a little bit a computer I got some software all from savings just investing like I'm going to get some software for this and I invested in the domain and all the different parts of getting graphic design done um, so when they said, how much would you rent your, your, your wireless mics for? I was like, uh, let me check my rates for you. And I, I went and looked and I, 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 I kind of looked around at what a good rate was, what a good price for some, some wireless microphones was and, um, ended up purchasing some and offering them. And they were very, you know, they were very happy. And I, I was sort of just buying things as gigs came up. So a lot of my earliest, um, money was just going right back into the business. I wasn't taking a paycheck. And this is 
a pretty common occurrence I know for most entrepreneurs where you're I was still working at churches and I was still doing some freelance music on my own, but these these earliest and I was still a grad assistant at the very beginning, finishing up my graduate work. Um, so I was I was I was had had a little income. My wife was working as a teacher, so we we had a small apartment, it wasn't a lot of overhead in my life. So I was just putting the money back into the business, you know, a wedding came and I would buy a new gear for the this I started doing DJing and I I'm not a DJ, um, but you know, wedding DJing for most weddings is a good playlist and some lights and sound system and you know, give me my money. Um, and as long as you're kind and friendly, you can, you can do that. And that, that was a good lucrative way to start as well. It was this very, very heavy market of, of weddings um, because it was fairly easy to do and, and, it, and it was high demand. Um, and it went pretty well, you know, the 1st years, I don't, I don't think I, you know, I think I showed an, a loss on my taxes for the 1st year. I started, I think somewhere around June in the middle of the summer. I think right when I was graduating with my, um, my masters, I was like, all right, what can I, what can I do here? And, um, into the 1st year, most of it was just going out again. And then, um, into the 2nd year, I was breaking even that was pretty great. Um, and I was getting more clients. I was getting reputation and so, and as, as much advertising as I was trying to do with. Facebook ads and things, n nothing was as effective as the word of mouth and people, you know, contact to, to reaching out to contact and. And that's really 1 of the reasons I stuck around the Kalamazoo area was because because of my school of music time, my graduate assistant time. Um, I made a ton of connections so people would come to me. Um, and I also did some work in, in kind of creating jobs like I, uh, 1 of the things I was proud of doing, whether I did them well or not was. Um, helping an artist, so I said, hey, I like your music. Let's why don't I help you make your album and then with however you sell your album for, whether it's through a, a Kickstarter, which was new at the time or through. Um, some other, like, you know, family and raising money and afterwards, we'll use the music and the, and the, the, the final product to, to raise the funds to pay for it. And that worked out pretty well. I was able to make a few albums for artists who are like, yeah, I don't know how we're ever going to make an album, but we love our music and I was able to help them raise money. Um, music industry has changed a ton in, in the 10 years since then, but that was a cool way to start just to, to like front the front the labor for them, knowing that it was going to pay off uh, later. And what we call that most oftentimes in the, in the, in the arts world, I was doing it on spec. And so I didn't know that at the time, but I was basically doing things on spec. And, and I also offer like, hey, for, because I'm doing this up front, I'm, I'm asking for like a percentage addition and like rates. And most artists were fine with that because by most of the time they would, their families would and friends, just just them donating. By the end of it, we had you know five, ten, fifteen thousand dollar budget. Um, you know, four member band. They would all family and friends. They would they would fund that at the end. So they would and they would have their album, and I would have a decent a decent check for my my work, and that would be good. Um, on top of that, I was also doing more work with my friends who were videographers, um, and we were we were building. Um, uh, different videos that we were doing videos together, but one of the things I got to do for them that was really fun was I was writing original scores for some of the clients, especially specifically some of the wealthier clients that had the money and they wanted a more branded concept that wasn't stock. So, for instance, Kellogg was a big one. So, Kellogg, we were doing through their connections, they got hooked up with the um, um, recruiting department at Kellogg and doing the recruiting videos, and which is great because that's a huge organization recruiting all over the world. Um, and they're, they're wonderful to work with too. They're just a friendly company to work with. And so we were able to, I was able to write a bunch of these kind of organic, you know, fun, happy Kellogg sounding songs that for them, it saved them, you know, they have being as big as they are, they have to play, they have to pay $5,000 for a license for one video. And instead I could charge them half that and I could do it all myself because I, I had the skills to do that or, you know, hire a couple people to help. And, and it worked out really well for everybody. So that was kind of the early days of getting in with this working in the more higher end video and, and audio world. Oh, here's just a couple pictures of the very early. I tried to find some early pictures of the things I was doing. Um, <laughs> yeah, very, very simple for anyone who knows this field. Like this gear is all very old and this is a very old system. And this is always a wedding and here's a, here's a recital I was recording. So lots of lots of just whatever I could find and lots of, all through connections of different people. So I mentioned uh, my cohorts, uh, who are still my cohorts, um, uh, primarily Drew Raklovitz. I'm not sure who knows him, but he's a, he was we were about the same age at Western, and we, we knew each other pretty well. We were planning to start a business together, but timing and things that were going on ended up we started up separately. So they created Overneath Media. Overneath Media was a video company. Um, they they were they started originally because they were going to do all the videos for a church in town, and the church gave them 
a small like up in the corner of the youth room and office and that became their office and as part of that they had a dis big discount on their their first videos they were making so they'd make their weekly videos or special event videos um, and then, of course, just trying to build their brand with uh, same with me with weddings. Weddings is a great way to start in this particular service field that we were doing, um, but slowly building up their you know, connections and brand. And even to this day, we still have clients that we knew from back then that we met at that time. Uh, and so they were they were working in parallel. We were hiring each other for a lot of things. When I do like a, a recital or a concert and they want video, I hire them when they needed something like an audio professional for their video. They hire me. Um, so we were doing a lot of work together and then in 2014 or like really during the, during the year of 2013 we realized that why don't we why don't we merge and make this one big entity and so we we got together with a lawyer another from another contact friend who who a friend of the family of one of the owners of uh, michael steinke who uh specialized in in, in business business um law helped us draw up a, an operating agreement. That was the first time I had to do that because as a, as a sole proprietor, I, I didn't have my own operating agreement for myself, but um, talked about merging assets and creating a new entity. And then we had an opportunity to purchase um, a space downtown um, on the mall in Kalamazoo for the Brown and Brown recording studio, which was again, another friend, another contact who they uh, had passed away a few years ago, the husband who ran it and they'd been holding onto it for years. And we had a chance to take it over and you know, make it something again. So we, we did. We, um, we, <clears throat> we, we merged together to create Overneath Creative Collective. Um, I chose to give up the GBG name because it's just my name. So I didn't think that was, I mean, it was hard. You know, I, I built this brand and this personality around it for, for four years. And so I was, I was like, okay, that was, that was a hard, <laughs> a hard thing to do. But Overneath was more generic. It was kind of fun. And then also one of the more practical reasons is that when you, when you work with a company like Kellogg or Bronson Hospital, you have to be part of their vendor system and getting into the vendor system is a complicated process. So changing your name is also a complicated process. So being able to, being able to keep, keep the Overneath name for that, I didn't have any clients where that was a big issue. Um, so we decided to go with Overneath and we decided though to rebrand. It was a brand new LLC um, called Overneath Creative Collective. Uh, eventually, which was shortened down to Overneath Creative because so it just was easier to, to say and people were calling us Overneath anyway. People still sometimes are like, you're the under over company, is that right? Under and then, so na names matter. If they can't remember your name, I guess it's a problem, but Overneath somehow is stuck pretty well, which is good. Uh, so here's a picture of the space we bought. Um, we had a, a very, very large recording studio space um, and video studio space that we, we decked out with some of the nicest gear. And um, this is our first time we ever got into a uh, SBA loan. So we, we had, I had done some line of credits just to help get through certain, like when I was doing those, um, those, those artists who I was fronting the time, I would do a line of credit just to help you know pay bills and then eventually um, we pay the line of credit off. Uh, and then we, this was the first time we, we went to a SBA loan. We had a great personal banker at Fifth Third uh, who uh, Drew's dad had worked at Fifth Third, so we had a good relationship with them. But I, we had met uh, Sarah, that's the lady who helped us, and she just walked us through the process and was really, really helpful. Um, and so we got an SBA loan for the space and equipment to, to make sure we at least we decided if we wanted to get the space, we didn't want to just have it and then not have any gear to, to fill it. And so we we had a big starting budget to put items in the space to make it marketable. Um, and so we had the largest, the largest uh, recording studio in Kalamazoo, and then we could do video productions in there as well. Um, a series of office. This picture is just of the studio. There's a few offices back in this area of like the hallway. So there was it was a big, big space, and there was a whole open, unfinished space on the other side um, that we had. And it's, it's it was basically the entire second floor of the Milliner Center downtown, um, which was above what was formerly Manja Manja. It's now owned by Radiant Church, who we we ended up selling it to. Um, but it's it's a big it's a big facility just above where Manja Manja used to be. Um, so, yeah, I mentioned this is the 1st time we did an operating agreement. This was the 1st time we learned about what an S corp was. Um, it, that was, it's a fairly kind of weird thing with the corporation system in America, but it, it, it was, it was our way to figure out how, what we wanted to do as like, do we want to just take profits? Do we want to pay ourselves? And we, there was 4 owner or 3 owners at the time and eventually a 4th who earned equity early on. Uh, we had 4, it was pretty top heavy. and. And so for us, the, the S corp system was, was the way we decided to go. So we'd have a steady income for the 1st time. Um, all of us have been operating as sole, as sole proprietor and a partnership for overdue media. And so we were, you pay yourself what you think you can draw. 
um, based on your own, you know, your earnings for the year, or you take it during the month. So having a having an S, as an S corp be able to give ourselves our first W fours and W two employees was a new thing. Um, we learned a lot about joining of assets, and it was hard for me having I bought a lot of things with my own money, but then I was get, my investment was all the gear I bought and all my bank accounts going into this new bank account. We learned about the joining of assets, um, and then it was adjusting the leadership structure. That was a big thing too. Um, I had been. When you start a business, as anyone who's here who has started a business knows, you are the salesman, you are the marketer, you are the product, you are the HR, you're everything. And so having to, getting to give up many of those things. So some of the other owners took over the marketing, some of the others took over the sales. And I, it was hard for me because I, I had a, I'm kind of a control freak. Maybe that's a somewhat common trait of business starters, uh, but having to give up and then having to be okay with when they did it a different way than me, uh, if they messed it up from the way I would have done it and being like, and I, I wasn't always graceful with that. And my other owners can tell you, I could, I could, it was a jerk sometimes when they would mess up a sale or a client, they said the wrong term or something, but, um, but learning how to give up control and, and for the, for the greater good of helping to grow the business. Uh, you I, I was never going to grow trying to run the business and make the product at the same time. I mentioned the SBA loan and then learning how to deal with a commercial mortgage, which is very, well, it's not that different from a from a, a personal mortgage, it just costs more. <laughs> Mainly it just, the rates are different and the down payments are different and the needs are different, but the idea is the same. So we had a, we had a mortgage on our space as well. Uh, so for five years till 2019, we, we did this and we grew pretty, pretty well. We made it work really well. Um, we had a, about a 10 person team of full-time staff and then um, a series of contractors in our world for a service-based company like mine, uh, in the arts, contractors are very common. So when we were still doing weddings, we had like a contracted DJs that, that we'd work with that were part of our team, or we'd have uh, for video, we'd have certain DPs or gaffers or grips that we work for different projects. But we had a 10-person team inside, um, and then a series of contractors. And for five years, we, we grew and we did okay. Um, but I will say that part of that is that we were not a high-paying company. We we're still operating like a, a startup. Like, and everyone we hired, we were like, hey, Come join us on this startup. We're still doing this journey. And even as we got bigger, we were noticing like, all right, we're having a hard time scaling this with, you know, to, to, to give people benefits and higher pay and even things like having a cleaning service. So we're not having to do the dishes all the time or we're vacuuming the floors when we're trying to do a video. Um, and so in 2019, I went through a, a particularly difficult time of burnout. I, I burned out pretty heavily in audio and music and I got very exhausted with that field. Um, and we came to a conclusion that while we were doing fine with audio, it was a market that we kind of felt like we peaked in. There was some other good competitors in town who were doing a good job and the market wasn't going to grow. And so we decided that for the best interest of the company, we would sell off all of the audio side of the company and focus just it on video. Um, this, this turned out to be a great decision. Um, it, it is. It was the hardest, the hardest part of it, though, was just for me personally, having to give up that part of my identity. Um, and it was a big moment for me to sort of change from being even even after 5 years of being a, um, in a, in a business with others, I still felt like a self employed, like I was doing it myself. Even though I wasn't, I was still, I was still learning not, not to do that. And, and it, this was the moment where I finally got more into the business side. And I said, this is the right business decision. Um, we were able to make, we had, we had improved the space. We had an opportunity to sell the space to Radiant Church, who was very, very eager to get downtown. So we made a great profit on the sale of the building and sold all the audio equipment. And um, I was able to shift to doing audio work just personally as a freelancer. So I started a separate LLC for myself, which I can, it's just called Gordon Van Gett LLC. And that's just focusing on all freelance audio work. I have no overhead other than I guess a couple of plug-in things I pay for and insurance and stuff, but I don't have space anymore. I just, I operate as needed. Um, and then overneath, we moved out of downtown and we ended up becoming lessees, um, which, man, early on in this, in the, the process of doing this, one of, one of the, one of the big business guys in town, Bob Brown, who owns Trey Star is a friend of mine. And he, I asked him for some advice and he, cause he's a real estate guy. And he said, don't get into real estate. I'm like, what? You're just trying to make me buy from you, Bob. You told me to buy your Trey Star properties. But he was saying is like owning a building is a, a whole other business that I, he was right. Like, I, like when, when, when the air conditioning dies or when a, a door breaks or even, you know, this paint's chipping, like these are things that 
someone's someone's job is to take care of that building. It's it, it, I mean, in a smaller building, it's not so big a deal, but in a place like ours, running the building became a, a money suck, and it became a whole other um, like job part of overneath that we had to have a facilities manager. Uh, when we moved into a space, we had, we had worked with uh, Council of Commercial Real Estate, um, another just great couple guys. I couldn't recommend them more. They were they were so helpful. They built out a space for us in a one of their new flagship buildings uh, down on Portage Road. Um, and they've been such great landlords. They they have they have their own uh, construction crews, and um, they buy, and they sell, they broker, and they and they operate buildings. And they've been having someone who now, like when the air conditioning doesn't work, they'll fix the air conditioning. We just say, hey, fix the air conditioning, please, so we can focus on our what we actually want to be making. And that's not a right or wrong answer. It just we decided we didn't want to be building owners. Um, some people do, and that's great. I mean, you have to hire a building manager, and that's part of the part of the overhead you have, and that's that's no problem. We we decided at the time we wanted to shift how we operated as a business. So we we uh we had a lot of people at the time who we had a, a lot of young video and audio people who were looking to expand out and they were using overneath as a great it was a great job. Everyone seemed to like working there, uh, except that it was low paying and it wasn't gonna be their forever job. So we had a couple one who moved to Chicago, one who moved to LA, they were just and it was at that time we were like, you know what? This is a good time to do this. We have a lot of people who are moving away to go to their next big thing. Um, why don't we do what we were thinking about doing and getting rid of a lot of the top heaviness? So a couple of the owners stepped out of the of working at Overneath, and then we had a smaller staff that all got paid more. And so everybody now who wanted to stay, wanted to be part of Overneath, was now having a stronger reason to stay there. They had a more more devotion, dedication to it, and starting it. 2019 over the next few years here, we've developed a profit sharing program. We developed a, a open PTO policy. We have healthcare, we have 401ks, all of these things to make Overneath a destination for those who want to work in the Midwest area in video production. Um, again, audio became a separate thing that I do myself, but video, video specifically high end video production. Um, and this would this turned out to be a great decision for us because we were able to retain talent. Um, everyone was able to, everyone who was there wanted to be there and wanted to do their best work where early on, not that they weren't doing their best work, but it was, you could tell that it was like, you guys aren't paying me a lot. I don't want to work extra hours. And that's, that's a pretty common labor issue. And, and especially in the service and arts field, you have this sense of, and I will say in the, in the non nonprofit field too, where you're saying it's an issue you care about. You should just work extra hours because you care about it. And there's this part of your heartstring. that's like, yeah, I really do care about it, but I also need dinner tonight. So you. You really want to have a paycheck. So being able to offer uh, a place that people can be to enjoy to be, and then also to um, have a paycheck and give them a, a purpose for their careers was a, an ultimate goal. And I think we're we're not certainly not there yet. And our, our healthcare is is coming up, and it's it's started. It's got to start somewhere. But we're we're really proud that we were able to start these items and make a, a team. So we have a team of about six now, um, a full time staff that that all seem to be pretty happy to be there um, and are. Are focused in on on the job we do and are proud of the work we do. Um, oh yeah, I guess I skipped ahead here. So, um, folks, with smaller staff, higher pay. Oh, more arrivals from the journey. So I, I put this on there because it was a, it was a term we kept using a lot as we were having our like administrator meetings. We were saying like we we just want to tell them to like, come on this journey with us, like just grow with us, just come with us for a while, and you know, eventually we're going to get there. And and uh, it was kind of a sales pitch to as an HR person to say. Hey, I know we're not going to pay you much and we don't have any benefits and we can't give you health care, but uh, just, you know, come, it's going to be something great. Just stick with us. And that was great early on, but, you know, after 10 years, you think to yourself, we've got to, we've got to arrive somewhere at some point. And so stop reinvesting all the money into the next big camera or the next big space or whatever. And so we wanted to have more arrivals. And so I think that was kind of having the health care and benefits was a big arrival for us and being able to, to change that. That mindset, so people weren't coming to join the journey; they were coming just to, to be a part of their careers. And certainly, if anybody was going to go make videos in LA and for movies, they're not going to do it in Kalamazoo, and that's totally understandable. Um, but now, as we as we put out job listings, uh, we were getting interest from all over the country, um, which was a new thing. We had interest from a DP in New York who almost came over to work with us, and um, just really proud to have people from all over that were interested in having a destination like ours. So. Yeah, destination, not a, not a stepping stone. Certainly people are going to have us a stepping stone. You know, if again, if you're going to go work in, in the movie field, you're going to go work in LA. Um, but if you, uh, if you wanted to come work at a, at a nice, like commercial video company, like ours in the Midwest, this is a, there's a few places in town. Rhino media is another one. You might know them. They're wonderful. Um, a few others around that are just like really top 
Uh, and we wanted to be part of that community of, of top video companies to, to be at. Uh, and it also, we, we were able to get a strong vision for the future. You know, we, we, a long time, we were sort of just like making that as we went along. Uh, but now we've been focusing in on like five year plans and growth and, and realistic goals and so, somewhat like crazy goals of like, hey, someday we want to be able to make a Nike commercial or, you know, travel the world, make a documentary. But these are all things that we can work towards now and say, all right, we're going to, we're doing a commercial for Steelcase. We're doing a, a big project for Kellogg. We're doing a big project for Stryker. And, and so we're hoping we're, we're, we're in that direction, which it feels really good to have those, those directions at this point. Um, so I was going to just share a couple things from our work, uh, and then I'll do some question and answer time. So I, I don't know how great the quality will be um, with uh, WebEx here. So I'm just going to share my web browser. So I popped them open here. Hopefully you can see. You probably just see in the WebEx one right now. Let's get out of that and go to. Um, so this is one we just finished making um, for uh, a bike commercial. Uh, it's just a 30 second short, but we're pretty proud of the way it looks. This is a cyclist, and so is she, and so are they, and him. She'll get there. Sure, we may all do it a little differently, but we do have one thing in common. We all ride. We all ride. We all ride. Well, come get your ride. So yeah, we're pretty proud of that. It was it was done on spec. We had we had used pedal as an example company that we would sell it for. So don't don't call pedal and be like, hey, I loved your commercial. They it's not their commercial yet. It could be, but it was done on spec. Um, this is something developed before COVID, and then COVID hit and everything screwed up. And we told we told them at pedal like, hey, we're gonna make this on spec. If you guys want it, you can have it. We just wanted to have it for our reel. We might license it or sell it on on, on a row, but we're gonna pedal was our original intent. Um, and then uh, I was gonna show. Uh, I, I, I'll jump through this a little bit. This is something we made for Bronson recently. Um, I think I'm allowed to sell to show this one. We had one for Striker or uh, for Striker and for Steelcase that we just did, but um, can't show those yet. So I'm going to show a little just portions of this guy for the Mother's Milk Bank at Bronson. Bronson Mother's Milk Bank. Together, we help babies thrive. Bronson Mother's Milk Bank provides a vital service. Our human milk bank opened in 2006 and joined the Human Milk Banking Association of North America, also known as Hambana. Since then, thousands of donors from our milk bank have impacted the lives of fragile babies in the state of Michigan and throughout the country. Hambana accredits nonprofit human milk banks in the U.S. and Canada and provides guidelines for pasteurized donor milk. Donor milk. And breast milk in general is the best nutritional source for creamies. It's easiest to digest and it's the best tolerated of all the nutritional materials that we have. I was seven months pregnant and I got sick with COVID and pneumonia. I got admitted to intensive care and Carla was born two months early out of our control. So he had to come in. The donor milk was definitely a plus. He liked it and it was good that you know he was able to get it. Uh, on a side note of this one, there was a guy mowing the lawn that day. I just didn't know. And I had to spend a lot of time finding those frequencies and getting rid of the lawnmower in the background because it kept buzzing in the middle of the interview. Um, but this was a special one because it was a, it was a, it's a very sensitive topic and it's a very sensitive group of people. Um, later in there, someone who lost their child uh, after five months old and was telling their story. And so being able to, Bronson trusted us to to tell the story you know, tastefully and that, that just meant a lot to us that they would trust us to do that and these families were really just share with us their journeys and the different different parts of you know sharing breast milk was a big a big a big thing there so um and then uh i'll show you one more um we i mentioned kellogg I'll, i might as well just show oh, that's animation i'll show you just one quick kellogg video if i can find that's over everywhere okay. sorry drew keeps altering the site which is good for your seo you know just keep little changes are good for your seo um, I know he's really proud of this one. We have a long history of curse, from seeing the promise of a single grain to the iconic brands we all love. We don't just see opportunity, we create it. We know the way people eat is changing, and we're excited to feed the future. Like our founder, we are pioneers. We are inventors. We take great pride in who we are. And that pride isn't just because we create some of the world's most loved food brands. Because of the inclusive mindset of our company and the hunger we have to win together, 
It's because we are a company with a heart and soul. Together, we are creating billions of better days for families around the globe. And we have fun doing it too. Our spirit is contagious. Our impact is undeniable. We are making the world a better place for people, the planet, and the future of food. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for life at Kellogg? Kellogg, Kellogg's great to work for because they send us all over the world. Like they, they, they send us to Dubai and, and Mexico, and it's just, it's been it's been great working with Kellogg because we like to travel. Um, but I showed that one also because that was an original score that I got to write uh, as a musician and audio engineer. So that was that was a fun collaborative project to write music for Kellogg. that's branded for them. Um, sorry if you're hearing the rain in the background. It's now pouring rain in my house. So. Um, all right, so that's I just wanted to show you a little bit of the product there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing here, and I'm going to let the Q and A time. Thank you so much for hearing my my fun little story, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, Gordon, we do have quite a few questions. Um, before we get to those, if you are attending today for Spurs Credit, I've posted the event. The Experience WMU link is in the chat, um, and I also put my email there in case you have any issues accessing that. Okay, so Gordon, first question: If you had to start over again, what are some of the things you would do differently? Man, so many things. <laughs> um, one of the things is to I had a hard time taking advice from people that I, I don't know, deemed shouldn't give me advice. But the truth is, they they all could give you advice in some way or another. Um, I probably would focus less on the business and more on the product early on. Although it, it's hard to say that because the product, the business did it did do well to have a brand go with it. But um, I was so focused. I spent a lot of my time just like trying to make sure we looked right and felt right. Um, but if I had done more things on spec, more things like free projects, that might have been a better a better start. And um, yeah, I would do differently. I don't know. It's hard to say because so much of what what I am now is because of what I learned from those things. So, you know, I, I didn't take the business classes, so I, I had to I learned a lot of that on the job. And some of some of it's like, well, I wish I had taken business classes if I would have known about how to deal with those taxes that first year better than I did, or how to save properly for you know how you're doing your taxes. And um, I think one thing I will say, maybe not in the very beginning, but f don't overlook building a budget. And that seems kind of odd because. Like you think about, oh, I know I have a few things that, you know, we have our loan payments for the SBA loan, a couple of things, but having a full budget has been so helpful to keep track of how everything is spent and then where it's, and then shifting budget around as you need to. If you're by yourself, you don't like you have to go to a committee or anything, but being able to say like, all right, I now see that all the money I'm making for these things is going to that. I am not making a lot of money yet, so I need to adjust how I'm doing my processes, either lower overhead or uh, raise prices. Um, so being, I guess, don't overlook making that budget early on, even if it's just a small budget. Okay. And what keeps you up at night? What are some of the opportunities and threats that you see for your business? Yeah. Um, I, like many other business owners or creatives, um, have a hard time sleeping. You know, I, I am not good at rejection. It's one of the reasons I'm I'm not a great musician is because I you know when you're always auditioning for things and you get rejected you take it personally and um, same with sales like I if you're going to be I've been reading the Little Red Book of Sales it's one of those famous famous sales books and he's very very adamant like you, you can't let you can't let rejection get to you you're going to get rejected a thousand times for every sale you make and um, I'm still pretty affected by like oh I, I I messed that one pitch up or I misspelled that word or I should have charged this and um, I, I, that, that's what keeps me up at night is trying to like, did I do enough? Did I do it right? Um, am I doing right by my team? Am I getting the right kind of work? Um, sometimes I feel like, am I doing the right? Am I going, am I going to events enough? Am I going to too many events? Am I wasting money on like things like ads or, um, spec projects? So those are things that keep me up. Um, what was the other part of the question? Any opportunities or threats that you see for your business? 
Um, well, I think we're in the middle of the opportunity. You know, we're doing a bunch of these spec projects right now where we're building building a project the way we want to do it, and then like selling it outright to other to um, to clients. Uh, much of our work comes in the form of a client coming to us and saying, "Here's something. Here's something we like. Um, can you make this? Our budget's super low. Um, can you make it awesome? Like, well, if you want to make it awesome, it's going to cost this. And like, they don't fully see the awesomeness um, because they're new to it, maybe, or they don't they don't know what. Why can't I just use my phone? Or why do you need lighting? Or those things. So being able to have a project on spec where we get to build something from scratch our own way and say." Here's what it can look like if we invest the time and energy that we're talking about. Um, and I think having that in our portfolio has already paid off for us a few times with some major. We've had our, we recently had our largest individual project. It was, you know, a, like a 15 person shoot, like, which is for us is very big. Um, um, as far as threats go, um, yeah, there's always competition in the area. We, it's interesting being in this, I think a lot of business owners will say the same thing about their competitors. Yes, your competitors, but you're also sort of a community. You don't even like you have to kind of realize that. So like one of our biggest competitors is Rhino Media. And like we'll never say anything bad about Rhino because they're just they're good. They're good at what they do. But we still want to we still want to take their work. So it's not like we we want to win the clients, but we also get it if somebody picks to work with them because they do a good job. Uh so I guess the threats are like the other businesses in town. And I, you know, I struggle with like I wanna I, I want to I want to win all the jobs, but there's so much work out there that really is enough for all of us to be to be perfectly honest. And with the nature of video, one of the reasons we focused on it over audio is because we can reach across the globe with this. We can become there's there's companies like well even like Rhino who's working they did a they did a video for Zoom. You know they that that's that's not a Kalamazoo based company. It's a big company. Uh, so you can be from anywhere and operate. Uh, and, and do videos for anybody. So we're working our first, that's our first big client in California. We just got recently. Um, we did it. We did a, we submitted a proposal to a, a college in Texas that I've been doing a lot of work, just putting, putting the time into making these proposals and, and, and making them look nice and thinking about them and sending them all over and, and getting rejected, you know, cause that, you know, the college in Southern Maryland was like, why would we hire you when there's a, there's a bunch of video companies here and that that's true. Uh, and then we got one from Texas. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's it's the, the the threat of the other companies is always frustrating, um, but we also there's a ton of video is still king out in the world right now. Like there's I I we just been doing research on it and well I guess we're reading research on it and you know through COVID and even beyond like video content is the number one thing people engage with in a marketing in any in all of these communication situations. So there's a ton of work out there. So even though I want all the gigs, um, the the biggest threat is probably the other companies that are also wanting all, all the gigs. <laughs> Okay. And how has COVID affected your business and how did you adapt? That's a great question. Um, so I took over as president, um, right in the middle of all this COVID stuff. I've been, I've been, you know, I was running the audio department for, for a while. Then I, you know, we shifted, we shifted the business leadership and eventually I took over as like running the company. Um, and during COVID, we had, of course, many cancellations, many projects, but even for actually for Hayworth College, we had a big project for Hayworth that we had booked just before COVID started. And um, I think it's Stacy. I don't know if you all know Stacy over there. She's wonderful, but she's like, yeah, we just, everything's stopped right now. So it sat in our queue, but everything got, everything got put on hold. And um, so we had to do a few things. So one of the things we focused in on was what were the market needs at the time. So for instance, the streaming became a big need. So we started offering streaming services more. Um, for us, it was not something we really wanted to focus on. Um, it's a, it's, you know, broadcast video is a, you know, places like news companies, they have vans that go do this and sports, CBS sports, they're going around and doing broadcast, but you know, they cost a lot. Um, so we wanted to be able to say, well, we have, you know, really great gear. We have really creative videographers and we can just do that live. Um, so we were able to shift to doing more virtual events and that ended up getting us some work with, um. Like Kalamazoo Symphony Orchestra, they had to go all virtual last year, and I had connections with them through all, through music. Um, so we ended up doing their entire season virtually for them, and so we focused in a lot on virtual production. We did a a, a, a fully like they sent they submitted videos. We made these you know multi multi boxed videos of these professional musicians playing you know, Beethoven and things like that, and, and then we'd go and do special filmings with you know separations of, of people and recorded well and filmed well. Um, we got involved with MSVMA, um, which is the state 
choir association. Again, I wanted to do a choir, but they wanted to do it virtually. So we did a really big project for them where we had hundreds and hundreds of kids from all over the state submitting these audio, uh, them singing these clips, and they would, that was their festival this year. So we, we really shifted into focusing on what the market needs were. Um, we did we did work on getting a PPP loan. That was I did that very very early on. Um, uh, I was like one of those like sitting at the computer when the portal was open, ready to push submit. And uh, um, I at one point I even got on the news at local local news because I was angry that I had been doing that. And then when I submitted, it it was like, oh, we've already passed the amount. And I'm like, but how? Because I just submitted it and I couldn't have gone any faster. And uh, but we did end up getting it, which was great, but it was like, uh, like, oh, we didn't know the right people, I guess, to be at the bank at the right time. I didn't have that relationship. And, um, but we did, that was a big help to keep the payroll going for the, for that time. Um, and then, uh, what else? Yeah, that, that was, that was the main stuff we were doing. We focused on animation was another one. Um, we, one of the things I thought, I guess it was right around the beginning of COVID. We've been wanting to have like a, a bigger animation presence for a while, but when COVID hit, we were like, this is going to be something that people are going to want more of because it doesn't, there's what do we call it? Less virus spreading opportunities, less, less, less contact moments or whatever, whatever the term would be by having everything done in, in an animated way. You could tell these stories and messages and you saw it happening in commercials all over TV with these fully animated commercials. Um, and so that became a big focus as ours as well. Okay. And Gordon, our last question, and then you're off the hot seat. <laughs> What would your suggestions be for somebody who wanted to start up their business? This kind of makes me think of that question from earlier. What would you do differently is be aware of what your market actually is, is going to be a key one. Um, I think early on, I just wanted to do what I like to do, but I wasn't really sure if there was even a market for it. I just wanted to do it and it worked out. Okay. But it was hard. Um, so if you if you are interested in doing a particular thing, like you want to make, you know, be a photographer or you want to make food, um, that is great. And you may find a way to do that. Um, but if you want to focus on the business side of it, forget the product. Like what is it that the, what is it the market's dictating? Like what is missing in your market? Um, if you're looking, I would say, look, look at that first. Like what is the market needing? So if you wanted to be a chef. Are you noticing that there's not a lot of gluten free, dairy free food in the area? So, focus in on that aspect. If you want it to be uh, you know, building some kind of tech, what tech is missing in your area or whatever market you're going for? You know, if you want to make a social media company, how is that different from TikTok and Facebook? And um, focus in on what the market is. And then, and then be also be ready to not make money is another thing. Um, there are a few companies that had a big windfall early on. That is very true. Um, and I, I, I applaud them, but it, much of what you're going to do is going to take your time and don't be embarrassed to work at a coffee shop or work that side job early on. Like we you know Drew was working at Old Peninsula for uh, the first year of the company. I was doing all these working at churches and stuff. So we were all working other places and kind of doing double duty until we could afford to go full time. So don't be embarrassed about that. Um, and, and hustle. I think that's something when I've watched Shark Tank that I'm always, Mark Cuban's always pushing is like, did you hustle? Did you go out and do it? And, that, and that's that, and I, I'm always reminded of that because that's true. Like much of what you're going to do as a startup is like it's not going to come to you always. It's not going to just people learn is like, hey, you're making a new so and so. I'm going to buy it. It's going to take you getting the, the word out there somehow, going the quote unquote door to door, uh, whatever that means today. And for from, for some people that's social media work, for some people that's flyers, some people that's going to events. Um, so find out where your market is and find out you know hustle and go to them. Well, thank you, Gordon, for a fascinating presentation. Please join us for the next Entrepreneurship Forum on Friday, November 12th.